my name is Sarah Johnson and I'm here to explain load tracing in detail to someone who has never taken Structures 1. Although I do know this video is from Ms. Simons and I'm pretty confident she's taken Structures 1. The purpose of load tracing is to figure out exactly where the weight on a structure is going to end up. So whether it's a live load or a dead load or whether it moves or if it doesn't, it's important to consider exactly how much weight is put on a structure so that way we can account for that when it's built. And to find that path, we actually call it the load tracing path. It's literally following the weight as it moves through the structure on its way to the foundation. For example, if you put a vase on a table, the weight of the vase would be transferred to the tabletop, down through the legs of the table, and out into the ground. Both the tabletop and the legs of the table have to be able to support the weight of the vase. Similarly, on a simple structure, the weight would usually start at the top where the beams are and then transfer over to the girders, through the columns, and down out into the foundation. So if you've ever taken Physics 1, and I hope you have because it makes this class a lot easier, then you know Newton's second law, and that states that anytime something acts with force on an object, that object has to act back with the exact same amount of force. If it doesn't, that object will break under that force, and that is what we do not want from a structure. So that force that the object pushes back with is called the reaction force, and that's what we're solving for whenever we do load tracing. So when we begin to account for the loads in a structure, we typically start with the live loads and the dead loads just because that's additional weight added to the structure. But something we also have to consider is the self weight of each member because each member is going to have its own weight that we also have to account for. And whenever we do this, we typically do it whenever we're considering the tributary width. And the official definition of that is the distance between one member and adjacent similar members in a structure. I'd love to show this on a real life example, but this is the only one I have. It's from our last project and it looks like it couldn't stand the test of time well. It's been about two weeks and I think if a draft came through here, the whole thing would collapse. Since my only physical example isn't up for the job, my second best visual aid is a drawing. And I've drawn out four columns here with a few beams in between. The distance between each of these columns and the next one is 10 feet, and the tributary width actually determines how much of the weight of each of these beams rests on each column. And since each beam is being supported by two columns, it means that each column supports half the weight of each beam. So if you look at this column on the left, you can see that it's actually supporting this beam right here. Since it's supporting half of its weight, it means that the tributary width is going to be half the distance to the end of the beam, which is half the distance to the next column, and that's five feet. Then if you look at the next column, it's actually being supported, well, it is supporting two beams, and that's important to consider. So it's supporting half the weight of this beam and half the weight of that beam, which means the tributary width spans from here all the way to here. And that's each beam twice, which is 10 feet. Then if you look at this next one, it's pretty similar. You've got half of this beam. You've also got half that beam that makes another 10 feet. And this last one is really similar to the first. You've got this beam being supported and it's only that beam. So half of the weight of that beam is going to span five feet, just like this one on the left. This is the formula you use to determine reaction forces. R, that stands for the reaction force, equals L times omega divided by 2. L stands for the length of the member, and omega is the tributary width. The reason why you divide by 2 is, like I said earlier, each member we're dealing with is being supported by two members that share its weight. Each supporting member takes half, so our formula divides L omega by 2. Here's another example. This is the top view of a structure and you've got beams here, girders are here, and then columns where these letter I's are. Starting with the beams, they're spaced 12 feet apart each and they're 20 feet long. Over here is the given information and for the loads you have 55 PSF of live loads and dead loads is 71 PSF. That stands for pounds per square foot. Together that's 126. And like I said earlier, you do have to account for the self weight of each member and it looks like the beams are going to be 30 pounds each and the girders are 40. So I'll start with B1, and the first thing you do is calculate your tributary width. It's the only beam being supported by these two columns, so the tributary width is going to be half the distance to B2, which is 6 feet. Then when you go to B2, it's being supported by these two girders, but these two girders are also supporting B3, so that's going to be 2 times 6, which is 12. Same goes for B3, because it's exactly symmetrical to B2, so it's going to be 12 feet there as well. And then B4 is exactly symmetrical to B1. It's only these two columns supporting that beam, which means it's going to be six feet. 
The next thing you do is your force diagram, which shows all of the forces acting on a member. This is beam one, it's 20 feet long, and it's being supported by columns one and three. These are vertical forces acting upward on the beam. Then you also have a force acting downward in the middle of the beam because it's carrying that 126 pounds. So whenever you solve for your omega, you have to take that into account. So your omega that you plug into the formula is going to be your tributary width, that's six, times 126, but you also have to account for the self weight because that's going to be an additional 30 pounds. When you solve for this, it's gonna come out to be 786 pounds, and then you plug that into the formula. So the reaction force on beam one is gonna be L times omega divided by two. Your L is your length, and that's 20 feet, so you've got 20 times your omega, which is 786, divided by two. And whenever you do the math, it comes out to be 7,860 total. Before I move to beam two, I can also say that beam one is going to be the exact same as B4 because it's exactly symmetrical in the structure, which means that this force is also going to be the reaction force for that force. So beam one equals 7,860, which also equals beam four. Moving on to beam two, I'm going to solve it exactly like I did beam one. I'm going to say that it's supported by girders one and two and it also has a force acting downwards in the middle of 126 PSF. Then whenever I do my omega, I'm going to do the tributary width, which is 12 this time, times 126 plus the self weight, which is 30. This comes out to be 1542 total. Next thing I'm going to do is plug into the formula way over here. And I'm going to have the, re the reaction force for beam two is going to be equal L times omega divided by two. And the distance, that's L, is going to be 20 feet again times omega, which is 1542, divided by two is going to come out to be 15,420 total. And last, I can say that the reaction force that I solved for beam two is going to be the exact same as the value for beam three. The reason why is because it's exactly symmetrical on both sides, just in the same way that beam one was equal to beam four. And now I have the reaction forces for all of my beams. So the next thing you wanna do is a moment diagram. And this is a diagram of girder one, which is being supported by columns one and two. A moment diagram calculates all the forces that make an object want to turn at a specific point. The point I chose is column one, which means we won't account for it in the math. And since we don't want it to turn, it means that the sum of the moments is going to be zero because Newton's second law says that if the sum of the forces on an object are equal to zero, then it won't move. And C2 is going to be my only unknown because if the sum of the forces are zero, I want to know exactly what the force of this girder is going to be on this column so it won't move. So the first thing we're going to have to do is calculate the force of this W in the middle. That's the self weight of the beam. And so what I do is I take the self weight, which is 40, and then I multiply it by the distance or the length of the whole beam, which is 36. And that comes out to be 1440. So in addition to all these reactions, this reaction here is going to be 1440. So now that I have all of my reaction values, I'm going to set all of them equal to zero. And what I do is I take the value and then I multiply it by the distance from the point that I chose. So B2's value is this 15 or 20 and I'm going to multiply that by the distance which is 12. Then I add the next one which is that 1440 that I just found times the distance from my point which is going to be 18 feet. Then I'm going to add the value of B3 which is another 15 for 20 times the distance which is going to be 24 feet. Then I'm going to write it down here that last value is C2. I don't know what it is, but I do know that the distance from it is going to be 36 feet, and all of that is equal to zero. So whenever you solve for all of these constants, that total ends up being 581,040. Then you have your minus C2, which has to be subtracted because this force is going in a different direction than these forces. It's actually trying to turn this girder in the other direction, so we have to account for that with a negative sign. Then whenever you solve for C2, it ends up being 
18,157.5. So since we know that this column is pushing back up on this girder with this much force, it's also safe to say that this value is going to equal how much weight that this girder is pushing down with. And that's also same for girder two because it's exactly symmetrical with girder one. So now we know the value of the reaction forces from the two girders. The final thing you're going to do is trace this weight to the columns. And the columns are easy since all of these forces are in the same downward direction. You just add the weight that each of the columns is supporting. So if you start with C1, you can see that that's supporting G1 and B1. And the values for those are your 7860 plus your 18157.5. Let's do the math, that comes out to be 26,017.5. Then you move on to your next column, which is C2, and that one supports G1 and B4. But since B1 and B4 are equal, this value is also going to come out to be the same as for column one. Likewise with column three, that's supporting B1 and G2. And since B1 and B4 are equal and G1 and G2 are equal, then we also know that C3 is going to be the exact same value. Same with C4. That one's supporting G2 as well as B4, which we know is going to give us the same value as the rest. So as you can see, these values towards the bottom are going to be more than the ones towards the top because these columns are gonna be supporting more weight. They're supporting the weight of what's above them. So now that I'm done, you can see a complete list of all my reaction forces and that's it. Mm -hmm.